here. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, hurt people hurt people. Broken people seek to be completed like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. They keep looking for the jigsaw. Today I have the honor and the pleasure of hosting Joan Yuta Lachkar, a pioneer and the mother of the field, in effect. If Kernberg is the father, he is the mother. And so first allow me to introduce Joan. Joan Lachkar is a PhD. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist in private practice in Encino, California. She's an affiliate member of the New Center for Psychoanalysis. And she is the author of a few seminal books. First and foremost, The Narcissistic Borderline Couple. 1983 was the first edition, if I'm not wrong. And then How to Talk to a Narcissist, How to Talk to a Borderline. <laughs> the, only, the only one missing is, why would you want to talk to these people? <laughs> then, then the V-spot, V-spot, V stands for vulnerability. We'll talk about, we'll discuss this a bit later. The disappearing male, I can attest to this. New approaches, <laughs> new approaches to marital therapy and common complaints in couple therapy and how to talk to an obsessive compulsive, which is the latest book published <laughs> this year. So quite an impressive list. And many of these books have been groundbreaking. She has a second shadow career, but she's not so much in the shadow actually. She's pretty famous for it as well. She is a psychohistorian. She had published numerous papers and articles on marital and political conflict in the Journal of Psychohistory, Front Page, and Family Security Matters. In addition, presenting a paper on the psychopathology of terrorism at the Rand Corporation, a paper I've read and, and cherish. So this is Joanne in, in less than a nutshell. There's a lot more to her than this. She is also a trained classical ballet dancer. And not surprisingly, it had impacted and informed her approach, as you will see further on. So this is going to be a fascinating journey. Um, Joanne is one of my idols. She had affected my work considerably over decades. And as I said, I regard her as the mother of the new approach to cluster B personality disorder, Kernberg being the father, <laughs> quite a couple. And the first question I, I would like to ask is, Joanne, could you tell us about your pioneering work and the people, the scholars who had influenced this work? Who were the influencers? Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Sam. It's such an honor to, to be uh, doing this discussion with you, especially uh, uh, presenting to the master. You have been a great influence in my life as well and in my, in my groundbreaking uh, work. Thank anyway, um, I was, uh, I like to think of myself as a pioneer, but actually there was someone before me. There was Henry Dix who wrote on marital tensions way back in 1957. And then the first analytic couple in collusion was um, uh, Martin and Bird, who actually introduced us to the first analytic couple, the um, obsessive compulsive who hooks up with the uh, histrionic, or also known as the love sick wife and the cold sick husband. Actually, way back in 1957, it was pretty common <clears throat> for obsessive compulsive men who are void of emotions to hook up with histrionic women. Actually, as my mother would say, of, of all the disorders, the OCD is the best. At least they make a living. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so <clears throat> when I first started this work, there was a lot of flack and a lot of criticism. No, you cannot analyze a couple. Psychoanalysis is meant for the individual and you're stereotyping. And this was very discouraging. Then I went to a conference at UCLA and it was on couple therapy. And the, the presenter, we had a Q&A and I said, well, how about this dyad in terms of a relationship, a narcissistic borderline relation? Oh, that's absolutely ridiculous. So... 
I, I was so upset. I left the room and I went down to the UCLA cafeteria and I'm sitting there in a somber state. And one of the, my colleagues came and said, what's the matter? And I said, I'm just very upset. And I'm writing these frantic notes about my couple. And she says, I think that's a wonderful idea. So I wrote it up and I sent it to uh, England International University's Press. Two weeks later, they gave me a contract. And then I was asked to teach at UCLA. Well, that's another story about how I happened to write the book, but I'll stop right there. Yeah, and that's the book, The, the Narcissistic Borderline Couple. It's uh, the second edition was published years later, if I recall correctly. There were two editions later. Two editions. Two yeah, editions apparently right? it, it, it caught fire or something. But mm -hmm. this, this work is, is an expansion of uh, the narcissistic borderline couple. Um, as I was writing the narcissistic borderline couple, I tend to realize, hey, there's more than one type of narcissist and more than one type of borderline. Of course, you talked about the malignant narcissist and Kernberg talked about different kinds of uh, narcissists. So I wrote about five different kinds of narcissists and five different kinds of borderlines. And of course, I got a lot of flack on that too. So I justified it by saying, narcissistic borderline states, traits, characteristics are not clear and concise entities for they do tend to flow as back and forth and to seep into different disorders. For example, there can be a pathological narcissist, a malignant narcissist that you know very well, an obsessive compulsive narcissist, and the same thing with, with the borderline. Yeah. However, the difference is <clears throat> the, the pathological narcissist or the pathological board, they are not cruel and sadistic and necessarily abusive. They may lie, they may manipulate, they may force everybody to, to prove their superiority, that they are they have special entitlement, and but they're not cruel. The malignant narcissist, then we get into the, the domestic abuser, even the global abusers like leaders, which you probably read about in, 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 in psychohistory. But the, when you mentioned the ballet, can I say a few words about the ballet? Sure, and then, then we will move on to the question. Uh, Please, oh, okay. Please. Well, being a frustrated ballet dancer, <laughs> I realized I could use some of the concepts from ballet and apply them to psychoanalysis. So here is a couple that does the dance, a rondo, a waltz, interactions that go on and on, round and round, that are circular and never stop. How each partner will project a negative a negative feeling into the other, like someone like a borderline and how the, the other then identifies or over identifies which that which is being projected. You can imagine how someone like a borderline who already has low self-esteem, a thwarted sense of self can easily be the target for the a narcissist projections. Yeah, we, we will come to that a bit later when we will discuss your concept of the dance. I can and... repeat it, I, I, I'll do the dance with you. <laughs> well, maybe off camera. <laughs> um, I, I would like to. I would like to start by by mentioning something that has nothing or little to do with allegedly, ostensibly, little to do with uh, with um, narcissistic borderline couple, borderline couples, but actually, possibly, it is at the core. Recently, there's been a lot of talk about prolonged grief disorder. And I had suggested that the narcissist... What kind of disorder? Prolonged, Morning? Prolonged, prolonged grief. Prolonged. Prolonged grief disorder, yeah. Oh, oh. And I, I had suggested that the narcissist is a grieving and mourning child. A child who is grieving and mourning the unrealized, unactualized, not actualized potential, and so on and so forth. But I wanted to ask you more generally. You keep saying that we should not confuse states of sadness, loss, and mourning with depression. You even say that many therapists do that. You said that sadness is normal and healthy. Depression is not. Could you elaborate a bit on this? And then we will go straight into the narcissistic borderline conundrum. I can't believe that you're bringing this up. This is such a huge point. I cannot tell you. I mean, I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not an MD, I'm pretty well 
uh, informed about psycho psychopathology and diagnosis, but I know for sure that when a patient comes in and they say immediately they're on medication and they're depressed, and then I hear their background and the history of abuse, molestation, abandonment, terrible trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, which you make reference to. And then I, I say to the patient, I'm not really sure that you're depressed. Well, what do you mean? I've been evaluated with depression. Mm -hmm. uh, well, can you sleep okay? Yeah, I can sleep. Or do you have loss, loss of appetite? I go through the whole, the whole criteria, criterion, no. Uh, but you say you feel so sad. Well, I feel sad because I'm depressed. Wait a minute. I think there is a confusion here between healthy, normal, normal feelings of mourning, grief, and sadness and depression. Of course, it can, it can augment and go into a, a depression. And to illustrate this point, I go through three phases of treatment. I'm not going to do that now because I don't think we have time. The first stage is um, shame blame. The second is more of an enlightenment. And the third stage is awareness of the transgressions or wrongdoings. And with it comes guilt and more of it and, and sadness. One patient comes back to me after being in the third grade of phase of treatment says, it's just terrible. You just ruined my life. I used to be so happy when I was in media in the first stage, and now I go around crying and miserable. Hey, wait a minute. This is the healthy part of you, and this is the vulnerable part. That's why I wrote the V-spot. I hate being vulnerable. Why do you hate it? It makes me feel weak, impotent, but this is the beautiful part of a man or a woman who can allow themselves to be vulnerable. Look at Schumann and Schubert. He was a musician, by the way, and that that was my approach. Mm. And, and today, uh, today I, I and other scholars, we are suggesting that perhaps many personality disorders, especially borderline and narcissistic, but not only, are based on, are actually prolonged or extended reactions of grief, mourning what could have been, mourning the potential and so on and so forth. And of course, Masterson and others, they had suggested that narcissism is a shame reaction, a reaction to shame, shame-based reaction. So I think, I think what you're doing is very important to distinguish depression, which is a clinical entity, from utterly justified and healthy reactions of sadness and grief, which is a form of processing. So I wanted to, I wanted to start with this, because there's a lot of pain and a lot of hurt and a lot of shame and a lot of brokenness in relationships between narcissists and borderlines and all other mentally ill people. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a very, very spot on point because as you and I very well know that narcissists have a very difficult time with introspection, looking into themselves, that when they do and they even face grieving, they have to face uh, a, a, a traumatic background. And I am the narcissist, I am perfect. I do not have any trauma in my life. And any bad feelings I have, I am going to project it out onto you. So they have a very hard time facing any vulnerability or any trauma that they've had in their lives because they are so much into denial and so busy trying to protect the nascent self and face that they may have an imperfection. As you know, the narcissist is the child of God, the yeah, the, the, I'm, the, I'm the going master, to read. The, the child who was in the high chair with a crone on his head and mm. cannot face any vulnerabilities. That's why I wrote the V-spot, by the way. Yeah. Whereas yeah. that's very different than the borderline who will use their grief in their traumatic childhood and become the victim. And they form these parasitic attachments to other people through their victimization. Even in court situations, like you talked in your book about court and the narcissist, they, they they know how to win the hearts of the judges and the mediators through victimization. So, um, yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question. No, no, uh, it, was, it was more of an exchange than a question. You, you definitely put your finger on, on something very important. I think um, demedic, demedicalizing states of sadness and states of grief, depathologizing them, is a crucial part of, of proper therapy. And we are not doing a good job there. 
we are not doing a good job there. We tend to medicalize and pathologize many totally healthy and normal processing reactions. So I want to move on. Well, that's, yes, please go ahead. Well, that's the art of our work is to help the narcissist recognize that there's a distortion. He thinks he's wonderful if he is a manic and he denies and he, he refutes his vulnerability to get, for the therapist to let him know that this is really the, the powerful part of him, not the weakness. And the people who are most susceptible to these interpretations are artists like musicians and composers. Uh, they come in with a grandiose self and then you let them know that it, it and you bond with your musicality. That's where, that's where we get them. Yeah, the survivor part. The survivor part is, the narcissist denies the survivor part. He says, I didn't need to survive. I was always omnipotent. I was always godlike. I didn't have to survive anything. I'm invulnerable. Yeah. Okay, I want to go to your, go back to your work. Um, you're at the focus of the interview, not me. So I want to go back to your work. And what I want to do um, is tax your patience by reading extended excerpts from your work. So these are excerpts from things that you had written, but they're so on point and they're so wonderful in their encapsulation of their disorders that I really must prevail on you and I must read them aloud. And they are absolutely wonderful texts. So we start with the narcissist. You say the narcissist, the entitled. And this is um, Joanne Lachkar. This is her text. And I'm quoting from them. She says, the narcissist is the entitlement lover, the special child of God, also known as his majesty, the narcissist. You know when you're around one, because all they talk about is themselves. They are dominated by a grandiose and exaggerated sense of self, believe the world owes them something, and feel they are superior to others. They have excessive entitlement fantasies. In court custody cases, they are the most difficult. They're the ones who feel entitled. They want all the visitation, the money, all the furniture, etc. Narcissists value such things as success, fame, physical beauty, wealth, material possessions, and power. The narcissist cannot tolerate having dependency needs and unwittingly project their needy selves onto the borderline. According to Kernberg in 1995, narcissists cannot tolerate the kinds of dependency needs in an intimate relation and they unwittingly project their, their dependent and needy selves onto the other, often a borderline who is a perfect target for the narcissist's negative projections. In treatment, narcissists are the one who will quickly flee when they're injured, not appreciated, when confronted, not properly mirrored, or when their excessive demands are not met. They are always asking for special favors, changing appointment times, coming in only when it's suitable for them. The narcissists cannot allow themselves the kind of dependency an intimate partner yearns. These are texts by Joan Lachkar, not my text, to be clear. Joan says about the borderline, the victim, the abandoned one. She says, the key to handling borderlines when mediation with their partners bogs down is to understand the nuances and motivation of the borderline persona. Borderlines are often as if personalities and they have an exquisite false self. She's quoting Winnicott from 1965. They can dupe, borderlines, can dupe the most seasoned therapists, let alone court officials, with a facade of being the poor victims, the betrayed and the abandoned ones. To defend against shame, borderlines are determined to win and prove their self-righteousness at any cost. They may appear normal, genuinely concerned about the welfare of the family, they are intelligent and often charming, but behind this facade, they scheme to coerce their partner into the bad parent role. In psychoanalytic terms, this is known as splitting and projective identification. So you distinguish between different kinds of narcissists and, 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 uh, and borderlines, and then you describe the dynamics of the narcissistic borderline couple the narcissist, narcissistic borderline relationships.
Can you, can you describe to us what happens when they get together? What happens when there's a bond? You called it the dance, drama, the mutual projective identification. Can you expand on this a bit? This is at the core of your I'm, I'm actually I'm actually going to read about what I wrote about the narcissistic borderline relationship. I can't seem to find it right now. Um, Don't worry, take your time. <laughs> okay, as, as you mentioned, this work is an expansion of uh, my narcissistic borderline couple where I describe what happens when a narcissist and a borderline get together in a marital bond, or should I say a bind, and together they do this psychological dance that goes back and forth. Again, to repeat how each one projects a negative feeling into the other, and then the other one, just like a borderline, is a perfect target for the narcissist uh, uh, pr projection. The revelation is that each one needs part of the other to go on with their developmental uh, drama. In other words, each one stirs up some unresolved developmental issue in the other. Because often people say, why don't you just leave them? Why do you just stay with a narcissist? Or why do you stay with a borderline? It is not so much the glue that holds them together. It actually, it, it, they, have tr they ask, how do they attract each other? God knows how they attract each other, like a fox to a rabbit. So it's not so much uh, how they find each other. It's what makes them stay is the glue that holds them together. This is very important when they say, why, why do I stay with this person? The therapist has a wonderful opportunity. Well, it's not a matter of, of staying in the marriage. But this relationship stirs up many unresolved issues for you, communication skills, many developmental skills. And of course, these they stir up remnants of old hurts and archaic injuries uh, that they bring into their current relationship. Well, you're just doing exactly what my ex did or what my ex-husband did. This is called, in simple terms, old, old baggage. So again, they, these interactions get into this dance or rondo that are ongoing, never ending. They go round and round. And this is what keeps them in the court system so long because they never are able to reach a conflict resolution, which is most frustrating, not only for people in the court system, but people who love and, and live with them. So if I were to say, what is the main, the main dynamic in treatment? I would say one thing and one thing only. The word is projection how this is the heart of the matter. Again, how these projections move to and flow back, back and forth. Um, for example, a narcissistic husband will project a feeling of shame into the borderline wife. You don't need a trip. You don't need vacation. You don't need to, we don't need to, you don't need anything. What, what makes you think you're deserving of it? And making her feel that she's worthless and not deserving of anything. And then, she then attacks and attacks him. And then that hooks into his guilt, his harsh superego. Oh, I'm less than perfect. Can I give you an example of the dance? Of course, yes, it's fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. He complains to the borderline. All you do is nag and nag, not knowing how to legitimately express her real needs. The borderline continues to nag demand. The more she nags, the more he withdraws. And you know, with withdrawal and isolation stirs up in the borderline, abandonment, obviously. The more he withdraws, she attacks. As she attacks, she hooks into his harsh, punitive, internalized superego of guilt. He ends up feeling guilty and she's shamed. Thus, it becomes a dance between shame and guilt. And I then you have to be I want to ask you, John. Uh, he, he ends up feeling guilty because he has this harsh inner critic, this harsh superego that she taps into and enhances. Yes. So he yes. ends up feeling guilty. She ends up feeling ashamed, uh, un undervalued, unworthy because he taps into her sense of shame and, and so on. But shame and guilt are very negative effects. They're very negative emotions. Why do they stay together? They make each other feel very bad. 
why do they need to feel bad? There's two reasons. Yeah. There's internal factors and external factors. The external factors have to do with some semblance of reality. Children, sometimes they can't afford to leave. Business, their work, their community, their family. That is the ties, the, the glue that holds them together. And then there's an internal reality, how one identifies, how one identifies with an internal bad object that um, Fairburn talks about. Fairburn helps us understand why people stay in painful conflictual relationships. As my supervisor, supervising analyst, Dr. Jim Grotstein used to explain very clearly and succinctly, it's better to feel the pain than to live in the abyss, the black hole, the emptiness. I'd rather slip my wrist, at least when I flip my wrist, I know that I'm alive, than face the abandonment. This is very, very severe borderline pathology, of course. So they stay because they bond to their internal objects. What is an internal object? The betraying object, the, the abusive object, the unavailable object. And so we could say, well, so what if they bond to an unavailable object? What does that got to do with, with the pain and staying in the relationship? What it, what it really means is that they don't know how to internalize that. For example, <clears throat> what <clears throat> the therapist could say, <clears throat> yes, <clears throat> yes, that other person betrayed you because there's a part of you that feels that you betray yourself. We cannot control the external abusers or the betrayers or the unavailable people in our lives, but that's not where the power is. The power was getting in contact with their own bad internal objects, like the betrayal or the abuser. And that's where the power is. So the, the borderline of the narcissists render a service to each other. They, they cater to these bad objects and to what you call, what you call the V-spot or the archaic wounds in psychoanalytic terms. That, that is such a good point because it stirs up uh, the new book that I'm writing is, it sounds like a Harry Potter series, how to talk to a narcissist, how to talk to a borderline. <laughs> now I've just finished the book, how to talk to an obsessive compulsive. Right. And it goes back to that first pioneer who wrote about the uh, histrionic couple and the obsessive compulsive husband. Well, I have reintroduced that in my new book because that is a beautiful example how each one needs some split off parts of the other. The obsessive compulsive could use some of the histrionic emotionality of the histrionic. And the histrionic could use some of his orderliness and, and routineness and ritualists of the other. So they do, they join together because each one needs some split off part of the other. Right. Now, the dilemma is, if I interpret that, say to the obsessive compulsive, you know, you really need some parts, some emotionality, because your wife sees you as a cold fish. His response could be something like, what? And I don't want to sound hysterical like her. She reminds me of my mother. And then, of course, that's where the work would be. Well, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about normal, healthy emotions that you really feel are dirty and disgusting. And that's probably why the obsessive compulsive cleans so much, because that is this internal dirtiness that they're trying to vent and, and get rid of. Could we, could we say that there is a process of merger or fusion between these two? They outsource ego boundary functions um, to each other. They, they kind of merge in some way. They become one. They're already, mer they're already merged. In fact, that's what I mentioned in the book. There is in the first phase of treatment, that is where the merger is. There is no distinction or, or differentiation between self and other. I am her and she is me and she is me and I am her. Right. By the way, I just want to, I just want to say when I say he is the one who's the abuser or he is the one. The, the reason I do that is because uh, being female, it's easy for me to say <laughs> he did this and he did that. 
but please, the readers and the uh, participants can always reverse it. It's just easier for me to, instead of saying he, she, or she, he, or he, he, she, she, I just say he. So yeah, I, 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 I empathize with yeah, so I don't want you to know. John, this is the, the end of part one. So I'm going to, to close part one. I'm going to send you another link by email and you would have to click on it and we will continue. Okay, that's, that's owing to uh, limitations, Zoom limitations. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna okay. terminate this session. I'm gonna send you another link and you can log, on, log in with the other link. Okay. Okay. Do I close? Do I close you out? You don't need to do anything. I told you. You just need to be. I don't need to do anything. No, I will do everything. Don't I can worry. just relax. Yeah, you can just and... absolutely relax. Okay. I'll I'll send you. Are you control? Link. Are you controlling me? Yeah, of course. I'm a narcissist. I I, I love I, it. <laughs> I don't mind it. I love it. I will send you another link in about ten minutes time, and then you could click on this link, and we will continue the conversation. Okay. See you soon. So, John, I wanted to ask you, you, you suggested the concept of V-spot or vulnerability spot, and you had equated it with the old psychoanalytic concept of archaic wound. Could you give us examples of the archaic wounds of the narcissist, of the borderline, translated from an abstract concept into kind of day-to-day -to -day, um, experience? I can't resist telling you how the V-spot came into being. You're right. Um, as I was writing, I kept talking about the early archaic injury of the narcissist, the early archaic injuries of the borderline. The archaic injury for the narcissist is that uh, he was the king of the high chair until the second child was born. And all of a sudden, the mother abandoned him and made the uh, superstar into the uh, next sibling. And the mother who does not know how to handle that, uh, that child will spend the rest of his life trying to prove that he is mother's special child. And so the same thing with the, uh, with the borderline, that the abandonment issue becomes such a pervasive force that anytime there's a, any semblance of abandonment, it provokes uh, it, 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 it is a provocation and it evokes an enormous uh, uh, traumatic reaction. The same thing with the uh, narcissist. When they, are, when they are narcissistically injured, their V-spot gets stirred up. When somebody questions them or doesn't agree with them, that is the V-spot. So as I'm writing, I'm writing uh, the vulnerable spot, the archaic spot, how each one has their own ar archaic vulnerable and I got so tired of writing the vulnerable spot. The vul I finally abbreviated and said mm -hmm. the V-spot. Very catchy. So I thought mm -hmm. in the middle of the night, I was having a dream that I'm going to write a book called the V-spot. And then I started laughing. Nobody would ever write a book called the V-spot. So just for fun, I have a very good relationship with my publisher in New York, Jason Aronson and Taylor and Francis. And I sent Jason Aronson this proposal about the V-spot. A week later, he sent me a contract. He thought, I thought it was a great idea. And the more I thought about it, it is a huge spot that even my manicurist will talk to me and say, you know, my husband really stirred up my V spot when he mm -hmm. refused to, um, you know, take me out to dinner and thinks that said I was too needy. So um, the question that comes up is, do these individuals have their own specific V-spot. As I just mentioned briefly, that the narcissist gets injured at the slightest provocation and will blow. But their defenses are different than the borderline. When they, when they get provoked, they don't just lash out or attack. They do sometimes, but overall, they do something even worse than attacking. They withdraw, they isolate themselves. You can imagine what that does for someone like a borderline personality. The provocation for the V spot for the borderline is very, very different. That whenever their issues of betrayal or abandonment get stirred up, they attack, they lash out, they call each other all kinds of names, 
Sometimes they even get abusive and violent. So the question is, and this is the OCD in me, is do each of these disorders have their own V-spot? In fact, I transferred this to my work with cross-cultural couples. Do countries have a V-spot? Does one country say to the other, you know, Turkey to uh, uh, Greece or something, you really hurt my feelings? Yes, they do. It's a collect through the collective group fantasies. So the narcissist, the the pathological narcissist has their V spot, the malignant narcissist, they each have their own specific area of vulnerability that when provoked, it blows like a tsunami. Mm. And, and when we say when we, and when we say provocation, that leads me to the next topic, and the next topic is communication. Uh, before we before we go to into interpersonal communication, I would like to read again an excerpt from Joanne Lachkar's work. <laughs> okay. An expert excerpt. And so now that I had them talking to one another, says Joanne, what do they talk about? As almost every therapist can attest to, complaints. In common complaints that bring couples into treatment. Um, published in 2014, uh, chapter four discusses how each personality type has a proclivity to their own subjective type of complaint, including various ways of listening or not listening. Couples think their issues evolve or revolve around sex and money, but more often they do about control, domination, Oedipal rivalry. The narcissist may complain when not being appreciated, the borderline when she's feeling abandoned, and the OCPD when things disrupt their sense of order. These complaints trigger many hurt and repressed feelings. Old archaic injuries stir up many old unresolved archaic injuries and vulnerabilities. So the V-spot, the concept of the V-spot, which is an extension and expansion of the old concept of uh, archaic wound or archa archaic injury, informs uh, Joanne Lachkar's work when it comes to communication. I mentioned at the beginning of the first part that Joanne had written a series of books, How to Talk to a Narcissist, How to Talk to a Borderline. And the only book missing in the series is Why Would We Want to Talk to These Guys? But okay, that's an, her next book, I think. But she, she, has, she has dealt, I think it's the most extensive body of work to deal with the issue of inter- interpersonal communication when it comes to people with cluster B personality disorders. How to communicate with these people? And she came up with two languages. Can you describe these two languages for us, uh, John? Well, first of all, I had all these narcissists now and all these borderlines and now all these OCDs. So what do I do with them? Do I just throw them into a chapter and just let them fight among themselves? So a good friend and a colleague said, you know, so much has been written about narcissistic borderline personality disorders, and, and but not too many have actually talked about how to communicate with them, how to talk to each other. So that motivated me to write how to talk to a narcissist, which is, of course, 200 blank pages, or <laughs> how to talk to, to, to a borderline. So it may sound very narcissistic of me, but I developed two languages. The first language is the language of empathology, which I have abstracted from Hines' cohort work on self-psychology, addressing the self-object mirroring needs of the narcissist. And for the borderline, I, I refer to the language of dialectics, which addresses the splitting, the splitting needs of the, of the borderline, abstracted, of course, from the works of object relations, mainly Melanie Klein and, and beyond. Uh, I'll give you an example of the language of dialectics. Patient comes in, doctor, doctor, I don't know what to do. Uh, I, I want to get out of this marriage. I hate my wife. She's a bitch. She's a terrible mother. She betrays me. Well, then why do you stay? 
Oh, because I let her. So then there's two parts of you. One part that loves her. This is the dialectic. And the other part that wants to get rid of her. Oh, but I get so mad and I get, I attack her and I, I fight with her. So the response is that when all these when all of these defense mechanisms are operative, it's very hard to know what to do because the ego goes into dysfunctionality and you're not clear headed. So the ego is responsible for judgment, perception, reality testing. So it is not what, while these defense mechanisms are operative, it is not a good time to make a major decision. And that is very soothing because then I, mentioned that there's two I was going to say Sam's so I'm not going to use that name there's two Johns one side that wants to get married and the ambivalent that wants to get divorced and these ties size somehow need to integrate so the language of empathology there are a lot of patients who who really oppose that. They think it's ridiculous. It's just too much work. For example, I had a patient who was married to a very, very famous doctor, world famous. And he was always busy doing depositions, going around the world. And she called him one day and she, she had twins. And she said, honey, could you please pick up some diapers and some formula for me? And he says, are you out of your mind? Do you realize how busy I am? And she says, I just need some diapers and formula for these. I've been up all night. What do you mean you've been up all night? You don't do anything. I'm the one who works. All you have to do is stay home and take care of these little twins. So she started to attack him. You're such an asshole. All you do is think about yourself. And I said, using the language of empathology, you said, what? She says, well, what am I supposed to say? Well, what I'm about to say to you may not make you, may, might make you feel sick. Oh, honey, you are such a famous doctor. The world renowned, I am so proud and honored to be your wife. And I know how busy you are. And I just need, I didn't mean to disrupt your world or schedule, but I just needed some takeout food and some diapers. She says, are you crazy? That's too much work. Do I have to say all that? I said, you know what? It's more work if you don't. Well, I have been criticized for this. You can imagine why, that I'm just giving a lot of BS and bullshit. But if you want to communicate with a narcissist, if something better comes along, I'm open to it. But this is addressing his self-object mirroring needs. This is building him up. You have to prepare him so he, like a laser, then you can come in. And then, of course, this, the same kind of approach would be for the borderline. So, in, so effect, in effect, avoiding avoiding provocation, avoiding triggering the V-spot. That's the language of empathology. Yes, and it brings up another point. <clears throat> Sometimes <clears throat> the borderline will lash out <clears throat> and say something, you know, you're just a piece of shit. You're a terrible mother. Uh, you need to, you, you, I, I hate you and I want a divorce and I want to get rid of you. And then the borderline will respond back. How dare you call me uh, all of those names? I'm a good mother and look what I do and blah, 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 blah. And I say, you know, I don't think you know the difference between borderline venting, evacuation, trying to get rid of a part of themselves as opposed to serious thought. Oh, I never thought about that. So what do I do about that? Here it goes again. Honey, I don't think you really mean that. I can see that you're very stressed over your work right now. You don't really mean that I'm a terrible mother. So using Beyond's concept of detoxification to detoxify the contaminants that intrude into the relationship and to transform aggression, anger, hostility, rage into pablum. I think that's beyond one of Beyond's most amazing formulation about the concept of moving from what he calls beta L elements to alpha function. Well, I won't get into beyond. He's impossible to understand, but I've tried. <laughs> He's French. <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> yeah. But 
that would render the relationship functional. Do borderlines want a functional relationship? Do they feel comfortable in a functional relationship? Oh, that is an amazing question. I'm thinking about Freud. Mm -hmm. Freud never knew or talked about the borderline personality disorder, but he did notice there was a segment of patients that would reach the pinnacle of success and suddenly would go into a massive regression. And in clinical practice, we see, I call that sabotage. Children like borderlines who've had a traumatic childhood, who have been deprived of their childhood, deprived of fun activities, have, to, have had to be the caretakers for their families. These children then sabotage all joy and all good things in other other per person. For example, my husband is supposed to go with me to my sister's wedding. And as typical at the last minute, he says, I'm not gonna go. Well, but I'm gonna feel terrible without you there. No, I don't feel like going. Or there's a, there's a, um, a christening or a bar mitzvah or a trip to Israel this woman was planning for months. At the last minute, he says, I don't feel like going. Well, what do I do with the tickets? What do I do with the kids? I, I just, they, the word sabotage really should be highlighted. This is key, what happens in these, in these relational dyadic bonds. It's a, it's a, it's a parasitic attachment. Which exactly. is- Exactly. <laughs> and so I wonder, I wonder if we should facilitate these, these pairings, these dyads. Um, we can teach borderlines and narcissists how to talk to each other, definitely following your work. We can teach them how to do that, but should we? That's a moral question. Oh, that brings up another thing. Okay, so here I have them, them talking to each other. So what do they talk about? They talk about complaints. And each, each disorder have their own, their own ar arena, a venue of complaints. They each the narcissist will complain about this and the board. So then after they complain, who's going to listen to these complaints? Somebody has to listen or not listen. So I didn't mention it in, in, my, uh, in my manuscript to you, but the works of Salman Ashtar wrote a book called Psychoanalytic Listening. And I integrated that into my work. He talks about like 10 different ways of listening, objective listening, subjective listening, interjective listening, counter transference listening. So I, I expand on that after I talk about the, the, the complaints. Yes, but my question, my question was more, more ethical or moral. Should we encourage two people who are basically dysfunctional and feed each other's pathologies, should we encourage them to stay together? Should we teach them communication skills and protocols? Should we, or should we, on the very contrary, seek to, to break this parasitic bond? That just recently happened in my clinical practice. This woman is so upset with this uh, borderline husband because anytime there's the least provocation he leaves sometimes he leaves for three or four weeks and doesn't doesn't come back and they're seeing a family therapist and they all say you know you should just leave him well she has she has a little girl who has some you know challenges some physical challenges and these particular medical care and so she she just cannot leave for external circum cir circumstances so I said to her, besides that, you're not really ready to, to leave until you practice these communication skills. Because when he calls you a piece of shit or tells you to fuck off, you then attack back. You don't know how to soothe him or to mirror him and to let him know the difference between saying he wants to leave and get a divorce as to a serious conversation about divorce, he's just eventing and getting rid of a part of himself to project fear and threat into you. 
So until we practice these communication skills, it's really hard to know what to do and to see the real relationship, which is buried under all these defense mechanisms, which leads to the dysfunctionality of the ego. When the defenses are operative, it's very hard to see reality. In, in my work, I, I, call, I call narcissists, I say that narcissists are selfless, <laughs> which is pretty you know ironic. I say that they are selfless. <laughs> it's pretty ironic because what I'm trying to say is that they're, they're selfless ego. because they're, they they're don't ego have is any, disabled. They d- they're so preoccupied with the self. Yeah, and, and their ego is disabled, is disabled by their defenses, actually. They don't have a functional ego and they outsource many ego functions and so on. And, 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 they, course, and, and But you also need to mention the main trait is they have no empathy for the other person. Here the borderline is the victim. She's crying. She's upset. You know, they, they, they find that disgusting. And to wait, pay wait, attention wait. makes them feel like they're responsible. They don't want to be. They're perfect. Yes. They're as perfect as mother wants me to be. Yes. It's... um. It's a, it's a very big problem because you keep saying that smart people make stupid decisions and they make stupid decisions because essentially the ego is suspended or deactivated by overwhelming defenses. And I would like you to describe this a bit more if you can. It's a very fascinating process. Isn't it amazing how smart people say and do stupid things? I mean, we can all look into ourselves how we've all done that. Um, I contribute that to the works of Otto Kernberg, who is a master of the ego. Most people don't even understand, even the most well-seasoned therapist. It's a very slippery term. It really doesn't mean that the person is full of themselves. It really means that the ego goes into dysfunctionality, especially when there's these defense mechanisms are operative or anxiety or post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, When the V-spot is ignited, vulnerabilities, the first thing that goes is the ego. So what is the ego responsible for? Number one, thinking. Two, perception. Intuition reality testing, and most important, judgment. For example, I'm having a minor fender bender and the police come and they say, what's your name? What's the name of your insurance? My name, my, my insurance, I, I, I can't think. My ego at that moment, 10 minutes later, oh yeah, I'm Joan Lashkar, my, my insurance is so-and-so and I get myself together. But at that moment, I can, since I've had some analysis, I can say, hey, I'm not stupid. My ego is just flooded right now, and I can't think. This has been a very helpful concept with patients who who think that they're stupid or they can't think clearly. And to point out the aspects of the ego is, is a very valuable tool that we need in our clinical practice. <laughs> in the footsteps, in the footsteps of uh, Henry Dix and, and others, you have been studying recently the another diet, another dysfunctional diet, which is the obsessive compulsive and the histrionic. Can you elaborate on uh, this a bit? That, that's new. That's a novel thing. That's that's well to most most of the public, even to me, by the way, that I'm well versed in, in literature and so on. This was pretty new. So, yeah, I've, re- I've reintroduced that, yeah. but I've reversed it. It's not always that the, that the man is the cold, sick husband and the woman is the love sick wife. Sometimes now, especially in today's world, the woman can be the cold, sick wife and the histrionic male. And together they, they do this, this dance. She has uh, you no know, feelings for me. Every time I mention emotions, uh, she just says, oh, don't give me all that crap. In fact, one patient uh, said to me in a session, uh, she was very OCD. She said, uh, 
I said, why don't you tell me about your feelings and how you feel about relationships and how you feel about dating and why, what gets in the way of you dating? She says, what do you mean? I should open up that can of worms. So the OCD has a distorted image of what consists in their internal world. This is the bonding with the bad object, with the dirty internal world. That's why OCDs are so preoccupied with orderliness and rituals and cleanliness and washing hands and isolation and don't touch because they feel they have a dirty, that emotions are dirty. So the question is, why, why do they feel they're dirty? <clears throat> Same thing, getting back to ground zero, the V spot. To get emotional means to have feelings and that stirs up feelings of vulnerability. My father was in the Marine Corps and he always told me, uh, boys don't cry. So they put on a facade, but after a while, it no longer works for them and they do come to conjoint therapy. I had one patient, let's see, I'm gonna disguise this. He was, let's say an engineer and he was obsessed with cleanliness and orderliness and everything had to be just perfect. And he would treat his relationship just like he was uh, doing an engineering structure. And so when we talked about emotions, he would say things like, uh, well, that's not, that does it with my work. Well, this isn't about work. This is about an intimate relationship. And there's a difference between being vulnerable in an intimate relationship and being an engineer. You don't need any feelings. But you do feel that, that, that your, your wife or vice versa, your husband, then contaminates you with her emotionality. So that is the bond that keeps them together. He needs some of her emotionality. And as I mentioned before, she desperately needs some of his orderliness to calm her crazy histrionic outbursts. So he experiences emotions by proxy, vicariously through her. What do you but what do you mean? I'm asking the the obsessive compulsive. Um, he experiences emotions vicariously by proxy through the histrionic. Yes, I at least she becomes the emotion the emotional compass for me. Right. And as she becomes the emotional compass, which I desperately need, which I which I have abandoned long ago, or maybe never had, as much as I need it. I have to repudiate it and refute it because it disgusts me. She disgusts so, me. So she disgusts me. She's she's dirty. She's emotional. Yeah. She's dirty. And then the next step would be to say that she's not she's not your histrionic mother that you identify with. Uh, normal emotions, people do not get out of out of line with them. They are able to just express them very. Simply like an engineer, I feel this way, I feel that way. And you could use your engineering approach to organize your emotions and you don't have, don't have to act them out because I can understand there is this fear that you're going to sound like your wife. Mm -hmm. I want to stray, to stray off script for a minute and to ask And you of a... course, there's the counter-transference. Yes. Um, I express emotions to you, but... I don't yell, I don't scream, and yet I have expressed many emotions to you. Oh, well, I like that. I wish my wife could do more of that. So that's where the counter-transference and maybe some of the work can develop. You believe in, in leveraging uh, transference and counter-transference in therapy? You don't regard them as, as contamination of the therapy, something that should be shunned and avoided? And... Well, most analysts would be appalled that I use counter transfers <laughs> and analytic <laughs> approaches, but we can't help it because uh, uh, a patient will come in and say, you're just like my mother. You just use me. All you want is my, is my money and my time and you take advantage of me. And then I have to interpret the counter transference. So then you see me like your mother, someone who just uses me, but then you don't see the other part of me that genuinely cares about you. So there's an opportunity to move beyond the counter-transference 
transference. But the countertransference, sometimes I'm just very open about it. Sometimes I'll just say, <clears throat> I'm having a countertransference reaction. Let me know, and then I, I get invited in. So I do use transference and countertransference. Yes, I think these are extremely useful tools, and it, it's, it's unwise to discard them. I want to stray off script and ask you a question that had not been agreed between us. Um, ever since the 1960s, we, I mean, the profession is trying to medicalize psychology to say that all these ideas about childhood and, and mother and upbringing and separation individuation and, and old conflicts and all this is nonsense. It's actually all about genetics, biochemistry and conditioning, some kind of behavioral thing, you know, even CBT, even cognitive behavioral therapy is a form of, form of you know, automated, automated approach to psychology. So I want to ask you, do you, why do you believe that early childhood upbringing, parental figures um, matter? Why do you believe they matter? Because overwhelmingly, unfortunately, the whole thing is being discarded in universities and so on. We are, we are told not to teach these things. They're not scientific. They're not established. They're not, they can't be true. It's total nonsense. It has to do with chemicals and with neurons and with genes and with everyone wants to be a medical doctor suddenly. Also, every psychologist wants to be a medical doctor. What, what, why do you think parents matter? Why do you think childhood matters? Well, first of all, there's two approaches. The old school approach was to get a gigantic history, uh, the, the genealogy of the family, how this first began, and do a whole psychiatric evaluation. But things have changed now. Now we start with the material, what the, what the person presents. If they don't mention childhood, genetics, we don't bring it up. We only deal with the material at hand. Beyond refers to this is the patient coming in without preconception or memory or desire. And then something repetitive happens with the patient uh, feels rejected or they have failure. And then we might say, well, where does that come from? Oh, it comes from my mother who rejected. Then we start inviting in the childhood, but we don't start with that. And then they bring up genetics and they bring up the DNA, maybe it's inheritance. You know, this all may be true, but that's not my job. My job is to deal with the psychological aspects and any of that you can deal with a neurologist or a psychiatrist or a psycho, a psycho, uh, a, a psycho, uh, psychopharmacologist who can deal with medication. But my job is just to deal with the, with the material that, that you present, uh, which reminds me of the most frightening thing that terrifies is most therapists is the affair. That is always very scary. But I start the beginning of every session before. Oops, the gods of the internet have cut, have cut us off. I'm afraid that I can't hear you, John. Just a second, let's see what's going on. Oh, we've been cut off. Right Joan, Joan, your entire answer had been cut off. Could you start from the beginning? The, the connection fell. Could you start from the beginning? The affair. The connection fell must be very weak. Oh, yeah. this is every... I'm not sure why, but I can't hear you. I don't know why, but there's no connection. It's the mor morality police. Can you hear me? I can hear you now, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. The affair is every therapist nightmare someone calls man or woman you know, I just, I just, 
No, jo Joanne, I'm sorry, but again, you're being disconnected. I, I don't know why. No, you. I can't. I I'm can't having hear you. an affair, and I don't want my wife. John, just a second. Let's hold on for a second oh. until, until the connection is stabilized, and let's try again from the beginning. Maybe, maybe I should. Uh, I'll listen. No, I hear you. I hear you well now. Let's should try I again. No, no, no. Let's try again. I can hear you well now. The, there is yes. every therapist nightmare. Somebody calls out of session, and can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. This during the session, but I'm having an affair. Well, the first thing I say to every patient or the patients before they start therapy is that anything that you tell me of, I will not disclose. In fact, I have the privilege as your therapist to disclose anything that you tell me under the roof of conjoint therapy. However, I don't disclose anything. I only deal with the material that goes on in the session. Okay, the affair. There's three reasons why people have an affair. Number one, it could be a one night stand. One man even went to a massage parlor, had a blow job, felt very guilty. Should he tell his wife? Well, that, that was not very significant. Or he went on a business trip and some gorgeous babe walks in and they have sex. The second one is that he meets somebody and falls madly in love. And he maybe eventually even marries her or has this affair and then it ends eventually. The third reason is that they feel insecure. They're not getting the satisfaction the feeding, the nourishment, the intimacy, the sexual gratification at home. And because they feel um, neglected and they will reach out. The narcissist will have affairs because they are always looking for external self objects to make them feel that they are really, uh, you know, big and grandiose and wonderful. The borderline will often have an affair you know, out of revenge, retaliation. So those are the three basic uh, ideas. And I present this to the person who finds out that the husband, oh, so many patients just come in horrified and crying. And it's very reassuring to know that, that you're the queen of the household. And this affair really meant absolutely nothing. And it's very reassuring, but it's still extraordinarily painful. They feel so abandoned and oh, I have why? so many stories why? about why why does well, an affair why does an affair do this to people? Even one night stands, one why do they have this in, inordinate effect on, on 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 the partner, on people? It's interesting. There are some women who'll say, Oh no, it wasn't a big deal, you know. I love my husband, he's a wonderful husband, he's a great provider, and uh, you know, I was thinking of uh, uh, of Clinton, you know, Hillary Clinton, you know, he had affairs, but he, he was a great provider and she really enjoyed being first lady. The same thing uh, with um, uh, this other president, uh, I, I guess maybe Kennedy, but there are other women who will take it as such a rejection of themselves. So I have to remind them, you're still the mother, you're still his wife, and you are the queen of this palace. This is your palace. And he right now is acting like a baby husband. But that's not to take away from the importance of your role as a mother and as a wife. That is a, such an important role. They love when I say you are the queen because they're so used to the narcissist being the king. Now I'm the queen. Mm -hmm. so, <coughs> I'm just giving women. you an outline of uh, how uh, I deal with the uh, affair, but I do not ever. Report uh, again, again the voice, with the again, patient the voice tells me out of session. First of all, it gets distorted. It gets dist can you hear me? Can you? Yeah, hear I can me? hear you now. But you were a couple okay. of people. 
Okay. John, I think we are losing the connection and maybe it's a good time to to say, uh, to, to say goodbye. I think we covered almost everything anyhow. <laughs> Can, can you hear me? Well, I really want to thank you for inviting me into this. Into, it's, uh, into it's, this a, drama. it's an honor. It's an honor. And couple therapy is a drama. It is, it is an experience between the three people. And we're always performing and we're always on stage, which means we have to really deal with our own counter-transference. And uh, the curtain opens, the drama begins. And we hope that we can effectuate a new experience. And with all we said about narcissistic and borderlines, many of them do amazing accomplishments in music and science. And so we respect those who have to live, work, and love with them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Sam, for inviting me in your most inspiring book. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. And it's been a privilege. And maybe we'll do it again. <laughs> we have a lot more to talk about. I would, I would love that. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully with a better connection. Take care. Thank you. Good to see you.